right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Chris Doran. I am a technical sales specialist for Global Test Supply. Thank you for joining our webinar presented by Global Test Supply University. Today's topic is principles of thermal imaging, how infrared technology is used, utilized for a variety of specifications and applications with CLEAR. We kindly ask you uh, to mute your microphone throughout the presentation. Uh, presentation will be about 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, we will have a Q&A section at the end of the presentation, and judging on how many questions we do get in throughout the presentation, we may uh, stop a couple times throughout as well. Um, so please, throughout, we encourage you to use the chat feature starting right now. Send all any and all questions that you may have in. Uh, we will try to make sure that we have we get to all of them. Uh, so Global Test Supply and Clear have been working closely uh, together for many years. We pride ourselves on being a leading distributor of Clear in the U.S. This is a result of our dedication to offering you our product expertise, our service, and our competitive pricing. Uh, today's webinar is presented by Russell Hall. He is based in Wisconsin and has been a channel partner manager for FLIR for the past two years. Russell, I will turn the presentation over to you. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Global Test, for having us and putting together this webinar. Um, you know, excited to speak to all of you today and give you a little glimpse of, you know, thermal imaging, if you never really dealt with it before, you know, some of the hot topics, you know, no <laughs> pun intended, um, and just some of the basics to get started. Um, I will say, you know, the screen that you see right here is a picture of actually one of our ITC uh, infrared training center classes. So we do have classes where you can become a, a certified thermographer, level one, level two, or level three. Um, you can get in depth. Um, these some of these classes are, you know, three, four days long. Uh, we also have some online versions of them as well, as well as uh, free tutorials that you can take. So that's on itc.com. What we're going to do today is just a, like I said, a brief, basic understanding of the principles of thermal imaging, some of the different solutions, and when you might use one solution over another, depending on the application, and then also some of the other. Um, uh, cameras and, and software that that FLIR has that really kind of create a whole package solution. So excited to be here today. Thanks for all of you for joining, taking some time out of your day, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll get started. So again, you know, I'm Russell Hall. I've been with FLIR for uh, almost three years now, two and a half years. Um, <clears throat> like Chris said, live in Wisconsin and I am a channel partner manager. Uh, we'll go through a little bit of the IR theory. How do the thermal cameras work? Uh, just scratching the surface. Important concepts of thermal imaging, so when you are using your camera, things to look out for, uh, or you know, reasons to buy which camera. And then why do we want to see heat? You know, why is that valuable to us? And then we'll go over some of our solutions, both cameras and software. So first, uh, what is infrared? So let's start with a quick definition here. Infrared is electric, electric magnetic radiation with wave, wavelengths longer than those of visible light. It's therefore invisible to the human eye. IR is generally understood to encompass wavelengths extending from the nominal red edge of the visible spectrum at 700 nanometers to one millimeter. So a lot of times you'll hear um, different words, you know, infrared radiation, uh, infrared just by itself, or thermal imaging, right? It's all kind of talking about the same thing. So when we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, here we have it from gamma ray to x-ray to UV, visible light, right, where human eyes are tuned to, what we can see, and then just beyond that starts infrared or IR, uh, and then beyond that, microwaves, radio waves. So you can see here that um, one micrometer is one millionth of a meter. So very, very tiny. Um, and <clears throat> so when we look at infrared, and for the most part, we're looking just to the left side of this, um, it's just past the visible, so 0.4 to 0.7 mic micrometers. Then you have the near IR, 0.7 to 1.7 mid wave three to five, and then long wave, um, eight to 14 micrometers. Most of the cameras that we're gonna be talking about today are gonna be that long wave uh, infrared, so in that eight to 14 uh, micrometers. Those are the cameras that <coughs> um, are, are most common, are handheld uh, thermal imaging cameras. So how do the thermal cameras work? 
So infrared or IR is emitted by all objects. Um, again, it's the electromagnetic wave that we cannot see, but it's there's a very structured, you know, follows all the same laws of physics. Um, it's generated by vibration of the molecules. So all of these molecules are, are vibrating, they're moving, right? And it produces off or it, it emits off this energy. Now, when you have a cold cup of water, you're going to have less vibration. You know, it's colder, it's moving slower. You're not going to have all that vibration or as much energy coming out. Um, now, when you have something that's hotter, it's going to, it, you know, it's going to be more rapid. It's going to be giving you more vibration, more energy coming out. And that's what the cameras are actually detecting. Um, I forgot, I'm actually going to close my, my webcam really quick just because sometimes the, the bandwidth um, is not all there. When we do the quest questions, um, I'll, I'll bring it back on, but I just want to make sure that I don't interrupt the, uh, the presentation. So apologize for that. Okay. <clears throat> so, so now we got the cameras, right? So these photons hit the detector on our camera. And the camera, come on, then gets, so inside the camera, we have what's called the, the Stefan Boltzmann law. Basically, these cameras, the, the camera calculates all the different energy that it has coming at it and puts it in this grid form. So there's two gentlemen, um, last name uh, Stefan and Boltzmann. They really, you know, uh, physicians, you know, back in the day, scientists that kind of figured out all this stuff, you know, even back in the 1800s, kind of figured out how objects relate to heat and how that works. So our camera takes all that information and then kicks it out into like this grid form. And then each pixel, if you will, is going to have a different temperature. And then we colorize those pixels based on the temperature. So generally something that's hot is going to be more of your, your whites, your oranges, your reds, and then something that's cooler um, related to the environment that it's in, it's going to be more in your purples and your blues. And so we take all of that, the camera uh, or objects hit the, the detector, we do the calculation, and then it spits out an image with colors that we can make some sort of sense with. So you might be saying, you know, wait, I'm so confused. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist by any means. Um, it's confusing to me too. But but basically, what we need to understand is that, you know, really what thermal imaging is, it's a technique of using heat given off by an object to produce an image of it or to locate it. Simply put, it's a tool that allows us to see heat, right? Because again, our human eyes cannot see in the IR spectrum. Um, so we use this camera to enable us to see that. And then you can see, you know, this just a, a fun picture of this elephant. I mean, if you've never heard of thermal imaging and you're on this call for the first time, you know, you could quickly see that the trunk is probably hotter, you know, than the rest of his body. The ears are a little cooler, you know, back here by his, you know, where it might be like a knee, you know, something's going on there, you know, maybe something's hot right there for whatever reason. So um, simply put, you point the, your camera at your objects and then it'll give you a picture and uh, the heat um, of the, those objects. So a few important concepts um, that we'll go over today, again, just in a base basic training. Um, one is gonna be resolution. Uh, so similar to TVs, you know, we used to have four, 420, you know, 720 DPI, 1080 DPI, you know, now there's those 4K and 5K, you know, ultra max TVs, right? Basically, the, the more pixels, the more resolution, the, the better your picture, your, the better your experience is going to be. So our cameras uh, kind of have a, uh, our thermal imaging cameras kind of have the same concept. Spot size ratio, we'll talk about that as well. Um, you know, how you're picture is going to differ um, depending on the strength of your camera or how far away you are from your target. And then transparency and reflection. You know, some folks might think that, you know, thermal imaging cameras can see through walls, right, or through objects. Uh, they can't always see through objects. They can see the, the surface temperature. So we'll go through each one of these in a little more in depth. So first, IR resolution. 
So again, many cameras, they're gonna be called an 80 by 60 or 160 by 120 or 320 by 240, you know, or 640 by 480 uh, IR resolution. Basically what that means is how many pixels or how many detectors are on that camera. So if you had, for instance, like an 80 by 60, that would mean you'd have 80 pixels going across horizontally and 60 pixels going uh, vertical. So you'd have 80 times 60, you know, for uh, whatever that is, 480 different pixels or 4,800 rather, 4,800 different pixels. Now, if you have a camera with more pixels, with more resolution, then you're gonna get a better quality image um, for the most part. So more pixels equates to higher density of measurement points, right? So you can see it's the same size square, but when we add more pixels, we're gonna get more clarity, we're gonna get more um, you know, resolution. And then here's just like a little image, right? So on this eight by eight, you know, you see a blob, it's yellow, a little orange, you know, some blue. 16 by 16, you know, you get a little more definition, 32 by 32, like, okay, this is starting to look like a portrait, you know, somebody's face. Now I can see that nose coming through and the mouth. And then 80 by 64, you know, now you can kind of see like even the ear over here, you know, kind of like an eyeball, um, you know, more heat generated on the nose. So basically it, it's that, right? So the more resolution that you have, the more clear your picture is going to be. And I just like this illustration, you know, again, as a base understanding of what that might mean. So why, you know, why is that important? And, you know, it, it is important. Um, the resolution of your camera and the application that you're doing, um, you, you want to make sure you got the right tool for the job. So when we look at this image here, you know, this substation, we got some you know, electrical energy running through here. Um, you know, you look at this and it says, hey, you know, this spot is 98.8 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Uh, and you can see the different connectors um, in, in all of that, right? You can see the, the buses and, and everything. You look at this one, you know, again, same type of thing. You know, we got some cables, you know, some wires coming out here. You know, hey, this one looks a little hotter than this one, right? We're, we're getting this hot yellow or hot orange over here. And my camera is telling me that this is 127 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, generally speaking, 127 degrees Fahrenheit is fine. You know, that's operating at normal temperature, maybe. But now when we look at this first image over here, you know, now we got more resolution. You can really see better what you're looking at. And now we, we got a temperature over here of 182 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's the same thing. It's the, the same object, it's the camera, the picture's taken at the same time. You know, this wasn't taken three days later and something was going wrong at this power generation plant. No, it, it's live, you know, it, it's the same picture, just with different resolution. Same thing here. This spot that we said, ah, oh, it looks a little warm, but nothing to be concerned about, is really 280 degrees Fahrenheit. So in each of these, you have, you know, al almost 100 degree Fahrenheit difference here and like 150 degree Fahrenheit difference here, just simply by increasing the resolution. So this, these images were taken with a 160 by 120 uh, resolution camera, and this one with a 640 by 480 uh, resolution camera. So again, the more um, pixels that you're gonna have, <clears throat> the more definition um, you're gonna see and the more accuracy you're gonna see in your images. It's kind of like, you know, rounding, right? Um, you could round and, you know, something that is, you know, uh, $107, you might round up to 110, right? Um, but it might really matter if that thing is, you know, $107.72, right? It's kind of like rounding. The more in depth, the more resolution that you have, the better story you're going to be able to tell. Spot size ratio. So this is another, you know, basic principle of thermal imaging and, and even, you know, spot gun temperatures and how they work. So <clears throat> what spot size ratio is, is uh, it's the smallest thing you can accurately measure at a given distance. And your temperature guns, your IR spot guns, your thermal imaging cameras will have indicated spot size ratio. So if we look at this and let's say it's a six to one spot size ratio, that means 
at one foot away, you'll be able to see an, a target that's two inches. You'll accurately be able to um, um, take the temperature of a target that's like a two inch diameter. At two feet, that target becomes now four inches diameter. So the farther away you are, um, the bigger that spot size will be. If you were six inches away, then you would see a one inch target accurately, right? And again, it's what you're accurately going to be able to measure. So let's say you're, you're looking at, you know, you pop the hood of your car and you're, you're checking out, you know, you're doing some diagnostics. Well, if you have a six to one spot gun, you know, when you're a, a foot away or, you know, a couple feet away from that target, you know, your area of interest really becomes this whole circle inside, you know, this yellow circle, um, not just that one spot. So if this one spot was, let's say 200 degrees, but everything else around it is, you know, 80 degrees, the temperature that you're going to get, the reading that your tool is going to give you is going to be an average of this whole thing because it doesn't have enough resolution. Uh, it doesn't have enough spot size to pick up what just this, you know, tiny, tiny spot is that you're wanting to measure. So then if we change it up a little bit with something that's a 24 to one spot size ratio. Now from that same one foot away, we're seeing a target of a half inch or from two feet away, we're seeing a target of one inch. So this is four times the strength when it comes to spot size ratio. So now again, when we're two feet away, we're actually gonna see that one inch circle. And if there is a problem here on this hose, if it's heated up or whatever that is, you'll be able to see that and it'll give you a, a good reading again as that's the highest or the most accurate um, reading that you can get. So here's a, just a little illustration again, if you know, envision you got a, a spot thermal gun um, and you got some fuse, fuse boxes here and you're gonna see, hey, do I have any hot spots in, in any of these electrical fuse boxes? You know, so you kind of go around, you're not gonna be worried about the doors, you're just gonna be scanning the connectors and, and the cables, right? Uh, this animation came in a little, little wrong, but basically what you're able to do is, you know, pin the tail on the donkey, if you will, right? So as you're going through with the thermal imaging camera, um, as you're going through with that spot gun, right, you have to scan everything. But if we introduce a thermal imaging camera to the mix, you know, with a good resolution and a good spot size uh, distance, now you actually be able to get a visual image of that whole uh, of that whole scene, where you don't have to point, you know, you don't have to, you know, scan exactly on that hot spot and find it. You know, the, the camera, the image will do that for you. Okay, so uh, a few other things: transparency, conduction, reflection. You know, can thermal imaging cameras see through walls? Again, right, that's a common question that we get. Um, <clears throat> and while Hollywood sometimes will, you know, do tricks to us, <clears throat> right, special effects and whatnot, here's actually a, a, a snip from Fast and Furious, just a picture here where, um, you know, they, they put this, our thermal imaging camera, one of our FLIR cameras, up to a, up to a door, a steel door. And behind that door is a bunch of bad guys. And so on, in the movie, like, hey, look at all these bad guys behind the door, right? Well, that would be great if you could know who was behind that door. Our thermal imaging cameras don't actually work this way. <clears throat> so we cannot see through solid objects because solid objects are not transparent. Um, <clears throat> and our IR detectors cannot see through them. So, but then some people ask like, well, what about studs on walls? I, I can see that. Am I seeing through the wall? No, you're not seeing through the wall, but what, what is happening is a process called conduction. So the studs in that wall, and even, you know, you can see in here, you know, where these screws might be, um, are conducting heat into the drywall. So it's actually changing the surface uh, temperature of that drywall. Now to, to the humans, you know, we can't see this. We might not even be able to feel, right? We won't be able to feel that temperature difference, but these IR detectors are so sensitive that it'll actually pick that up. So you're not necessarily seeing through the wall, but because there is some heat transfer, because there is some heat conduction going on, we can actually see those studs. We can actually see those screws in the wall um, coming through the drywall. But if there was, you know, a person on the other side of that wall, you would not be able to see the person on the other side of that wall. 
Um, another uh, principle is reflection, right? So, so what is reflection? Infrared radiation can be reflected by a number of surfaces. These include glass, water, mirrors, uh, and shiny surfaces. So most commonly glass <clears throat> um, is questions that we get. So you can see here, uh, you know, just a, a picture of a child. This is actually one of my colleagues, his son, did this little experiment. Um, but basically you can see the temperature being read, being read out um, on his eyeglasses are 75.6 degrees, right? So in this, in this image, it kind of looks like sunglasses, but these are just regular reading glasses. Um, but just because they're purple, they kind of give us that allure that it's, uh, you know, like sunglasses maybe. Um, when he takes the temperature off and we're still, you know, taking a, a reading of his eyeball, if you will, now we see that the temperature is 96.1 degrees. So it's not that this child, you know, instantaneously went from 75.6 degrees, you know, up 20 degrees and 96 degrees Fahrenheit. It's that the IR detector could not see behind the glasses, could not see what is what was behind that. And that is again called a reflection. So, um, our IR windows that cannot see through windows, eyeglasses, you know, goggles, they cannot see through that. So, but we do have something called IR windows, right? And so how do IR windows work? Well, IR windows are actually a calcium fluoride. It's a special type of material. It looks like, you know, we can see through it. it, it you know, we, our human eyes can see through it, um, but it's a different kind of material that actually lets the IR detectors pass through. And now you can see <clears throat> what's behind that. Um, if you have in this image, uh, an IR window installed on an electrical panel, now you can install this, electric, or this IR window and not have to open up that panel to see what's behind it. And you can do all of your temperature readings um, that way, which makes a lot more efficient, a lot more easy and safer to do those inspections. So again, those are just a few of the basic fundamentals of thermal imaging and, and IR theory. Now, why do we want to see heat, right? Like what, why, what's important? How can I use it? So heat anomalies tend to indicate problems <clears throat> and problems that left uh, unattended have the potential to create catastrophes. So like humans, right, when we're sick, generally we're gonna spike a fever, right? We, we've all been living through this COVID nonsense for the last you know 15 months um one of the first indications that you might have uh covid is if you're spiking a fever right oh shoot i'm getting a fever i hope it's not covid let me go get a covid test but you spike that fever you start to not feel good you're like hey something's wrong um you put a thermometer in your mouth and it, you know that might be an indication that you're sick right? Or your kid wants to play hooky from school. You say, nope, your, your temperature is 98.6 degrees. You're fine. Go to school. You know, you don't get to stay home. Um, so with many things, with humans or with, you know, electrical equipment, mechanical equipment, heat tends to indicate problems. And we want to find those problems to solve them. So many applications, electrical, if you're doing um, you know, looking at electrical panels, um, you know, power gen, <clears throat> um, any of that. Mechanical, if you've got motors, uh, conveyor belts, maybe something's not aligned correctly in a motor or you got bad lubric lubrication. Some of those things will start to create heat, right? We'll start to create a heat anomaly and that'll indicate that, you know, hey, this motor might crap out if left unattended. Building inspections as well. You know, maybe there's missing insulation or you're looking for a hot wire, um, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, the building is energy efficient, no leaks in windows, right? You can use thermal imaging cameras to find all of those issues. Public safety and security, um, <clears throat> you know, law enforcement, firefighters, they use our cameras um, to navigate, you know, fiery buildings or search and rescue or to find bad guys out in, out in the dark. Right, um, some things happening at the Mexican border. Right, you might have seen people crossing the border, climbing the walls, and it's at night, so our eyes are not working when it's pitch black at night. But we use thermal imaging cameras um, to actually find people in the night. Um, also used for search and rescue. Somebody gets lost in the forest or lost in a mountain. Right, you can put a thermal imaging camera on a drone 
and go look for that person and they'll send off a heat, right? Because they're gonna be hotter or warmer than the ground around them, or at least different than the, the ground or the trees around them, that that heat will come off and we'll actually be able to find that person. Through COVID, uh, again, like I kind of mentioned, you know, taking people's temperature was very common, still very common. If you're trying to maybe go into a restaurant or get on a plane or get on a bus, right? You might be asked to take your temperature in a doctor's office. We have solutions for that as well. So our technology was used in a big way last year to help people be safe, get back to work um, and do all those precautionary steps. Research and development, um, automation applications, we can do 24-7 uh, condition monitoring. So if you have critical motors or, or equipment that's running all the time and you wanna make sure that this thing never heats up, never breaks down, because if that breaks down, it's gonna cost you $500,000 and you know, off time and repairs, right? That's important. And then many others, right? This stuff, you know, uh, I talk to people on a monthly basis that are using a thermal imaging camera for something different, um, you know, sometimes that I've never heard of before. So then um, some of the solutions from FLIR. And again, maybe you've heard of thermal imaging in the past and you thought, hey, thermal imaging is cool stuff, but it's too expensive, right? It's really pricey, it's not for me. Um, and that was the case, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, when thermal imaging first came out and FLIR invented it back in the 60s, we had a thermal imaging camera that, it, you know, came in eight different parts, you know, it was kind of like the old computers, you know, when we first had computers as big as a, a room, right, and cost $50,000 or $80,000. Uh, but like a lot of things, as technology progresses, our cameras get smaller, they get more powerful, um, they get lighter, um, and they bring more performance as well as the, the price comes down. So we have cameras that, and this is an eye chart, I don't expect you to you know, be able to read everything on here, um, but just you know, a good image of, of the different cameras that we have. So a camera like this, our FLIR 1 Pro, actually connects to your cell phone, uh, an Apple phone or an Android phone. Uh, we have this compact camera that is the size of a phone, so fits you know comfortably in your pocket. And then we get to some industrial temp guns, some point and shoot um, uh, thermal imaging cameras, some professional, and then some high performance cameras. So, but down here at this level, you know, the mobile and the compact, these cameras start around, you know, $500 and then to the high performance, you know, yeah, we do still have some cameras that go up to $40,000 um, for those applications. But um, the folks at, I, at uh, Global Test Supply trained in all of our cameras, you know, very, <clears throat> very, uh, very, very well knowledge base over there and can make sure that you get the right camera for your application. And we can talk about that. I'm sure there's gonna be some questions around that uh, here today as well. So again, just kind of looking at this lineup. So this is our, our mobile compact type of cameras. Um, then we have our industrial point and shoot, you know, uh, USD from, you know, 1000 to $3,000. Then our professional, these cameras, you know, you're gonna have some more features, some more benefits, higher, uh, more powerful cameras, interchangeable lenses, um, so you can shoot things from far away or really close. And then we have our high performance as well. Um, so these range from about 11,000 to again, around $40,000, um, <clears> up to 1024 by 768 IR resolution. So again, for some you know, uh, utility applications, uh, for some research and development applications, you might find yourself um, higher on, on that end or if you're using cameras day in day out and it's a part of your business um, you know the investment uh, is, is there for you Chris I will take a pause right now uh, before we kind of switch gears to the software and if there are you know any questions uh, at this point that you want to bring up sounds good we'll do so I'll remind everyone that you can use the chat feature at any point throughout the presentation um, to get your to get your questions in. We have, as Russell mentioned, we have another section to go over and about a half hour uh, for that section and Q&A as well. Um, 
So we have a direct question about the uh, One Pro from Pam, which is the newest IR that connects to an Android. Perfect. Yeah. So we call it our FLIR One Pro, um, and there are we have a FLIR One Pro and a FLIR One Pro LT. Um, the Pro is going to have a little bit better resolution uh, and performance. Uh, there's about a hundred dollar price difference, and then. So we have the, the Pro and the, uh, and the LT, so there's two cameras, and then we make it on three different platforms. So iOS, and then micro USB, and then USB-C. Um, and I think, I always get them confused, micro USB and USB-C, but uh, I think micro USB is going away, right? And everybody's starting to standardize on USB-C. So, um, so yes, you would buy, for an Android, you would buy the, the USB-C camera. And then we do have uh, also, so Android or iOS, we do have apps available uh, for both Android and iOS. And so if you had, you know, any one of these other cameras and you had, um, you know, the app downloaded onto your phone, you can actually bring, you know, uh, an image onto your phone regardless if it's iOS or Android. So when you're looking at any other camera, there's no specifics for iOS versus Android only our FLIR One Pro that connects to the bottom of your phone. Perfect. Um, so looking at the slide and seeing the different options um, for cameras, something that comes up uh, quite a lot is in terms of residential, commercial, industrial inspection. Is it recommended just based on the price point for someone who's going to be doing that type of inspection to go towards something like the mobile or the C series, or would you recommend something uh, closer to the professional series um, for that type of inspection and application? Gotcha. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> definitely, you know, if you're doing if you're doing inspections, you know, day in day out, or you want to make that a routine part of your program. Um, Definitely, I, I recommend the professional. These cameras start at, uh, one, the resolution starts at 320 by 240, which is gonna give you enough resolution for most of those. And you can go up to 640 by 480 uh, within this professional line. So we do have a couple options there. Um, also, you're, you're gonna have the, the ability for interchangeable lenses. So, and that's important for if you're shooting something far away or really close. If you're shooting something far away, you're going to want um, what a lot of people refer to as a narrow focus lens. So on these cameras, it'd be like a 12 uh, or a 14 degree lens. So with a 14 degree lens, you'll be able to see targets, we call them targets, at a greater distance with the level of detail that you need. Um, sometimes if you're in like a like a small closet, right? Um, like a data center or something, and you can't back up far enough away, right? Because there's something prohibiting you from bar uh, from backing up uh, a great distance from your target. Now you might want a wide focus angle lens, or if you're looking at like a PCB board, right? You're you're doing lab bench um, research and development. You might want a wider angle lens so you can be close to it, but still get a broad view of that target. So usually what we see in our, I think back to the question, you know, industrial environments um, is this EXX cameras, our E76, E86, E96 cameras, this professional um, on up. Uh, the industrial point and shoot, these are gonna be fixed focus lenses. So if you're doing something from a great distance or, you know, something close up, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna have that ability to, to change that lens. Um, they're still going to give you a, a decent uh, image, but you're going to be a little little prohibited um, or restricted on exactly what you can do. Also, with this professional line, there's going to be more features like uh, text annotation, voice annotation, where you can actually input that stuff onto the image. <clears throat> and then if you want to pass that image on to somebody else, you can give them all the details of what's going on in that image. So, and then uh, lastly, to touch on this question, Generally speaking, you know, a good spot to start is, you know, how small is your target? How, what's the smallest target you need to measure and from what distance? Um, if we know the, the answer to those two questions, we can usually fit you in and we meaning, you know, global test supply 
can usually fit you into the right camera. Um, we're not going to upsell you just to upsell you, right? We want to get the camera that makes the most sense, but you know, we want to make sure that you're buying a camera and you're investing in the right one to give you the best performance. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, just to touch upon that, if anyone does have very specific application questions, you want to send us uh, something, you know, the details of, you know, the spot size, the distance, your temperature range uh, that you're looking for for a camera suggestion, please visit our website, globaltestsupply.com, the Contact Us page. You'll find uh, our phone number, email address, and you can actually connect with a live uh, um, with an agent through live chat as well. Uh, we'll address specific applications and suggestions privately uh, after the webinar. We do have a couple questions um, about emissivity. Um, one, just Matt asking to talk a little bit more about emissivity and another uh, from Faisal uh, is how to estimate the emissivity value and correcting the emissivity value uh, depending on the application. <clears throat> Perfect. Yeah, no, great question. Um, that that probably definitely be like the fourth thing, right? We talked about resolution, spot size, you know, reflection. Um, emissivity would definitely be the, the next uh, building block um, for thermal imaging. So, but yeah, definitely um, what emissivity is, is each object emits energy IR at a different rate. And it is calculated on a scale from, you know, 0, 0.0 all the one all the way to 1.0. Um, a, a black body, if you will, is a perfect emitter, will have um, uh, an emissivity value of 1.0. Um, on some of our cameras, <clears throat> and definitely you know, on, on the professional, there are some emissivity tables out there that you can you know, just Google emissivity table, and you can pull up some uh, you know, exactly what it is, just like a table. It'll say these types of material are you know, 0.98, this type of material is a 0.9. Um, <clears throat> and so basically what that means is if you have uh, an object that is 100 degrees Fahrenheit and it's a perfect emitter, then your camera will read 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If you have an object that is, you know, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but its emissivity value is 0.8, you're, it's it's not going to read 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It'll be lower than that because it's not a perfect emitter. It's not going to transfer all of that energy onto the detector of the camera. It'll get most of it. It'll get like you know 80% of it. It might not be a, a hard you know perfect calculation, but it'll get most of that um, value back to the camera for us to to look at. Um, <clears throat> so, but you know broadly speaking. You know, humans, um, you know, through last year with all the COVID, right, we're doing testing. Humans, our skin is usually like 0.95 to 0.98. Um, shiny objects, so if you have, you know, a, a shiny surface, those are generally bad emitters. Um, sometimes folks, uh, they'll take a motor or, you know, a, an electrical panel or, you know, or something, um, and put a piece of like electrician's tape, black tape, because that is a good emitter. Um, it's dark, um, it's not shiny, it's dull, and it lets that heat kind of transmit all the way through the tape and then onto the camera. So if you have a shiny surface of something that's hot and then you put a piece of tape over it, you will actually see the temperature difference, uh, which is pretty cool. So, but our cameras, generally speaking, um, you know, unless you're doing something very high tech, I usually set my camera at an emissivity value of 0.95. Um, and that's where I take most of my readings at. Unless I'm going to do something where the temperature, the absolute temperature is very important. I usually don't mess around with it. And again, because we're just looking for heat anomalies. Sometimes I don't care if, you know, my few, this fuse is 300 degrees or 308 degrees or 292 degrees, right? I don't really care. I just know that it's way hotter than it should be because it should be more like 80 degrees and now all of a sudden it's saying 300 degrees. Doesn't really matter to me that it's really 300 or really 307. Um, I just know that there's a problem there. So we're looking for those heat anomalies. Definitely if you wanna learn more and get deeper, you know, uh, there's some material out there, ITC uh, training classes as well, but great question. 
Perfect. We'll do one more, then we'll go back, get into the software section. Um, <clears throat> if, can you talk about the effects of, and I'll, I'll add, ambient temperature and outdoor relative humidity um, and the ability for a camera to detect an accurate temperature? Sure. Yeah, good question. Um, <clears throat> definitely. So, you know, ambient temperature, and you're going to see this more in doing outdoor inspections. Um, so ambient temperature, you know, can, can play a role in what the, the temperature of, of that object might be, especially if it's like a leak or something, you know, coming off, um, right at the source that, that temperature will, will be hot. But then once it starts to dissipate, um, you know, it'll start to cool down on your camera, you can input different values. So if you're outside and it's 100 degrees, you can tell your camera, hey, it's 100 degrees outside while I'm taking these these images. And the camera will, will calculate, will make some corrections um, to get you that most accurate reading. Uh, same thing with moisture. Um, again, not gonna get too too much into the weeds on how exactly those um, you know interfere, but there are settings. So again, um, in your camera, you can set those uh, different environmental settings um, it, to reflect and, and give you the best image possible. Just like emissivity, you can put all those in. They all play a, a minor role in taking that temperature. So one last question I do want to touch upon that we do, uh, I personally get to quite often, we do get often over here is, um, are there any options for um, hydrocarbon based detection uh, or oil and gas, petrochemical uh, type of options where is thermal a valid option? Yeah, so um, not in the cameras that you see here, but we do have, uh, opt we call them optical, optical gas imaging cameras. Um, so these gas finding cameras can find, you know, methane, natural gas, um, you know, different refrigerants, um, all of that. Um, those, Definitely you need a little more training. Um, they're expensive cameras. Those can be very pricey, uh, but absolutely we have those cameras. They're great for cost savings because if you do have leaks, you know, if you are leaking, you know, methane uh, in, in your facility, well, that's just money that you're spilling out, right? I live in Wisconsin, so we have winters, we have summers. In the winter when it's zero degrees outside and I have the heat on in my house to 70 degrees, I'm not gonna go open up the window, <laughs> right? And, and heat the outside and make my furnace run hotter. It's the same thing with leaks in your facilities. Um, you're paying for that gas, you're paying you know, for it. Um, you don't want it to leak because every time that it leaks, that's just money going out, you know, out the pipe. Um, so you, uh, we definitely have solutions for that. It's a good cost savings. And then also safety play. Um, if there's methane that's floating around, right, uh, flammable, um, you don't want that. Somebody lights a cigarette, you know, it could be a bad day for them and for everybody else. So it's a very safe, um, uh, you know, it's important to be safe and save that money um, that you otherwise would be wasting. Perfect. Thank you. So just a quick reminder, we will move on to the next section. Uh, but please use the chat feature from now until the end of the presentation for any and all uh, of your questions. I'll turn it back over to you, Russell. Perfect. All right, and I'm going to kill my webcam again, uh, just because I do have some videos in this section, quick videos that we'll play. Um, so software, so, you know, great. We, we got to, we're, we're gonna buy the right camera. We got the right solution for our applications. Um, and then, you know, FLIR also has software. So not all of our competitors have software nor anything as good or close to uh, what we have on the FLIR side. Again, FLIR being the, the worldwide leader in thermal imaging technology. So when we created the software and uh, we, we just revamped it, it was called FLIR Tools or FLIR Tools Plus. Now we're moving to a group of software that's called FLIR Thermal Studio. Uh, we have standard, and pro and as well as a, a free version. But really what we wanted this to be was, you know, effortless, efficient and flexible. Um, and so we'll go through a couple of these things right here. So here's some of the, the high, you know, 
the highlights, the, some of the features. Um, won't touch on all of them, but first, our last iteration, again, FLIR Tools, was running off of Microsoft Word. So when you went to create a template or a report, um, it was pulling from a Word, uh, you know, like a Word bank. Well, every time Microsoft Word went to update something, we would have to update it or it caused bugs, you know, so we're not reliant on that anymore. There's templates that are built in to the software. Um, and as well as you can create your own templates in this software. So we have, you know, a handful of recommendations, but then you can actually tweak each template and how you want to present that data. And again, you know, if you're in a business where your service is providing an inspection, having a professional way to um, present that data, present those findings is very important, right? Um, especially if you're charging for it as a service, you want it to come off as professional as, as possible. Some other uh, key takeaways here, batch editing, batch processing. Uh, now, if you went out and you did a job and you, you took 50 images um, and you want to analyze each one of those images basically in the same way, or they all have the same emissivity, or they all have the same, you know, moisture like we were talking about, you can set a setting in there and batch all of those together and do it once instead of having to do it one by one. Um, live map view uh, is, is a cool uh, feature as well. So um, your camera, our cameras are connected to GPS, so you can actually know exactly where you are. Now this is important if you're doing outdoor scans, maybe you're looking at different power lines and um, you, know, you wanna know exactly where that power line was, right? Inside a building, maybe not as uh, important. On a drone, you wanna know exactly where you're flying and where that image was taken. Um, rapid report desktop shortcut. So again, you can drag and drop images really quick right from your desktop onto the software. Super easy to use. So just a, a, a few of the uh, features and benefits of the new FLIR uh, Thermal Studio. We do have a, a free version for download. Um, there will be some limitations to this and you might have you know, some of these watermarkings on it where it says FLIR demo. So it doesn't, you know, crisp off as well as you know that nice high professional uh, because it still is our software um, but it's nice to at least get started uh, to, to check it out so it's available to download right on uh, FLIR.com you can also find it on the global test website and you can still do um, a lot of things with this software you can still do all that analysis you can still generate a report uh, you just might not be able to do some of the custom stuff one of those other features that you might that you won't have on your uh, the free version, but now on the the standard and the pro, it's going to be like polygon. So if you have an image, I can actually create different. Oops, I can actually create different shapes and different sizes to inspect an image. I might not care about all of this, right? I just want this kind of like looking trapezoid thing. Um, those that's the temperatures that's the the area or the target that i'm interested in now you can freeform make that own object before it would just be like a circle you know or a rectangle now we have this polygon feature which is uh which is pretty cool uh we also have something that's called msx alignment adjustment so uh, a feature on all of our cameras is msx and basically what that is is that our cameras have both a visual camera and a thermal imaging camera or a detector. And you can use them congruently and basically on your thermal image, we will emboss the visual uh, contacts of that image onto the thermal. So when I hit play on this, you can see that I'm actually going to adjust where this alignment is. So before I do that alignment, you can see, you know, if these are like windows or, you know, um, little boxes up here that they're not the same, this little decoration of a duck, right? Or a swan, it's not quite lined up, right? Everything is just off just a little bit. Well, you can actually correct that. So you can take um, this image and you can actually move it. So now if I'm looking at that swan, I can make sure that everything is lined up as it should be. And then MSX, again, you're getting all these visual context clues. Um, you can actually take a book and a, a piece of paper, or a magazine cover. And even though that whole magazine cover is the same temperature, 
when you're using MSX, you can still read all of the all of the letters, all of the words on it, which is a really cool feature patent of our camera. And then you can actually play with the alignment. You can turn it on, you can turn it off when you're in the software if you want it or if you don't need it. Um, we, you can also now rotate and crop images. So if you're out, if you're like a building inspector and you don't have your camera, you know, perfectly level or you're in a compromising position where you got to have your, your camera tilted. But now when you're, you're back at the lab, you're back on your computer and you want this thing to look a little bit better and, and make a little more sense, easier on the eyes. Now I can actually rotate and crop this to what is just important for me. So now instead of this house being on a, you know, on a slope in San Francisco, you know, kind of looks like that before the rotation. Now I can say, nope, it's, you know, on flat ground land. Um, now it's easier to look at this image. Here's a, um, the live map view that I mentioned again on the other slide. So here you can actually see where the person is, um, you know, where those readings are taking place. Um, and so if you took multiple readings, um, you know, or, or, you know, again, if you got a drone flying, um, you can actually see where this is. You can get these coordinates later on in a still frame as well, but just a nice little cool uh, feature. Advanced formulas, not going to, uh, you know, really dig in too much here. Again, we do have um, tutorials um, on our ITC website, uh, and you can find those on Global Test as well. Um, that can go into some more of this, but, you know, we can do average temperature, you know, compare this box to this box, right? And what's my delta? So you can do all of that stuff, which is, uh, which is really cool. And you can create even some of your own formulas. And then again, here's just uh, some resources. I think this uh, presentation will go live or, uh, you know, be emailed out or on the website that you can reference later as well. Okay, um, and then one of our other latest and greatest additions to our software is something that we call inspection routing. Um, this is a really cool feature, right? So everybody's familiar with Google Maps and how to go to, from point A to point B, right? Um, this is not an ideal route to go to all these different things, right? If you were, you know, delivering pizzas and you had 10 orders in your truck at once, right? You wouldn't take this route, right? You would make something that would make a little more sense, a little more time sensitive to make sure everybody got their pizza and it was warm by the time that they got it and you save as much time so you can go get that next order. So we have something that's called routing that you can build into, um, it's both a software play and a camera play. So on your camera, you um, you download this inspection route camera software. And then you can actually create a route <clears throat> on your computer and you can load that to your camera. So what am I saying? Basically, let's say you're an electrician and you're hired to do an inspection of you know, some building, some facility, um, and they have 50 different electrical panels and you know, motors that they want you to check out. Well, you can actually load each one of those electrical panels, um, all of those motors into a route, and then upload it to your camera, and then your camera will prompt you throughout your workday and say, First, we got to do electrical panel that's on the northwest side of the building, right? 1A. Then we're going to do panel 1B. Then we're going to do panel 1C. Then we got to move to the northeast corner of the building and do panel 2A, 2B, 2C, whatever that is, right? Whatever those assets are. So you can actually load that onto your camera so that you know you're doing everything you have to do. It eliminates paper because everything's right there, and then it keeps it organized in your camera, which then you can actually bring onto your software and inspect at a later time. So no need to bring that, that pen and notepad, no need to worry if you hit everything because your camera will tell you that this is the next asset you have to inspect. Um, and if there's not a value in there, if there's not a picture stored associated with that asset, it will tell you, hey, we don't have an image for this asset. You didn't do your job correctly, right? There was 
50 different assets and you only did 49 of the 50 different assets. It's also pretty cool. So there's six different levels that you can load onto your camera, onto the software. So first you're at, you know, large power generation company, right? So, okay, this is how I'm gonna library it, right? <clears throat> large power generation company, you know, customer A. And for customer A, <clears throat> there's, you know, 20 sites in this country. And at site A, at this one site, there's all these different assets, right? There's, and there might be multiple buildings, right? So building A, and then all assets in room A, and then check part A, B, and C. So there's six different levels um, or tiers that you can actually load onto your camera to make sure that you're hitting everything. And then there's a, a color coding as well. So you see the green dot right here? That means that everything is okay. This person actually selected, hey, I went into room A, machine A, and everything looks good, right? Nothing to write home about. You can make this green, you can make it like, you know, like a yellow, or you can make it red, like yellow, hey, maybe something's happening, you know, worth keeping an eye on. Red, we need to get somebody out here right now to, you know, correct this, to fix it. Um, then you can add notes, you can type notes in, you could simply say, you know, critical or, you know, critical, uh, could not inspect, maybe there's a reason you could not inspect that asset at that time. Um, and then again, you're gonna have your image and you can add comments. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's, again, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be predefined, you load it, and then all you gotta do is follow the camera's instructions. So even if you're the not the person that loaded it, but you're the person that's gonna go do the work, it doesn't matter because the camera is going to tell you where to go. So anybody can pick up that camera and know what they have to do. So really cool, uh, really helps you stay organized. And then again, make sure that you hit everything on your route and in the most time efficient manner. Instead of going from room A to room B and then you forgot to do something in room A, then you got to go back to room A and then you go to room C, right? This will say, nope, let's, let's take a minute to plan here and then we'll do this in, in the most efficient route. So really cool uh, add-on to our software. Chris, that is all I had. I know we still have a, a couple more minutes here. So if there's any other questions that have come in, we can tackle them uh, right now. Sounds good. So yes, uh, this is the time. We do have a couple minutes left. So please use the chat feature, get your questions in. Uh, if we do not have time to address them specifically, don't worry, we will contact you. Uh, one of our technical sales staff will contact you after the webinar to answer your questions uh, via email. Uh, so we did have a question come in. Um, do you recommend uh, regular calibration to maintain and ensure accuracy for cameras? So yeah, so that's a good question. Um, you know, FLIR recommends <clears throat> that you get your camera calibrated uh, on a yearly basis. Um, you know, I, I have some demo cameras. I don't, I, I probably miss those yearly um, calibrations sometimes. Uh, it's sometimes, you know, depending on the, the job or the application or your customer, you know, maybe your customer or maybe you're uh, in some sort of um, compliance that your all tools and, you know, um, solutions need to be calibrated all the time, right? Like even like a tape measure has to have like a NIST trace to it or whatever. Um, so if you're in one of those environments, you know, definitely do it once a year. Um, but if you generally take control or, you know, take care of your camera and you're not dropping it, you're not throwing it around, you know, it'll stay calibrated for a decent amount of time. You can also do some basic uh, calibration yourself. We recommend, you know, like I got a, a bottle of ice water right here. If I were to take my cap off, if I were to take the lid off or I had a bowl um, of ice water and I point my camera at it, well, I would expect that the camera would read, you know, 32, 33 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Because it's cold, icy water. If my camera reads 38 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, or 19 degrees Fahrenheit, well, I know that this is water and water freezes at 32, so it'd be impossible for it to be 19. Um, so you can do some of those. You could point it at a boiling pot of water, right? So boiling pot of water is gonna boil at 212 degrees. So you can do some of that calibration, but it, you know we would recommend once a year, you, you send it back to us, 
we'll calibrate it um, for you. But again, if you're looking for just heat anomalies, you can maybe stretch it out a little bit. If you're doing more like you're looking at PCB boards or you know doing something more R&D related and absolute temperature measurement is critical for your application, then definitely stay up on those yearly calibration cycles. Perfect. So to uh, to make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time, we did hit the top of the uh, mid the hour, uh, the end of our hour for this presentation. So. Russell, I will thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks for answering as many questions as we possibly could. A uh, lot of content in there, so please feel free. If you have any questions after uh, that come to you over the next course, you know, the next few hours, the next few days, feel free to reach out to us at any time. So, Russell, thank you very much again. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everybody, for hopping on. Um, yeah, it was a great. So on behalf of Global Test Supply University, thank you again for attending our webinar today. We hope you found it informative and insightful. Uh, we are available to assist you. Visit us at our website, globaltestsupply.com. You'll see our contact us page, all the ways that you can get in contact with uh, any of our technical sales representatives. Uh, as you can see on this slide, we also do have a rental program and rental uh, option for many of the different cameras that we talked about today. So definitely something uh, you can look into on the website. At the end of the webinar, we are going to have a short survey. Uh, we do ask you uh, to complete it if you can. It's going to help us improve these webinars and bring you more topics that are of interest to you. Uh, we also do have upcoming webinars. Visit our website and the training page of our website to see our complete schedule and list of subjects. And don't forget that as a thank you for attending today, uh, your name will go into a draw to win $100 for your next online order. Uh, the uh, winner will be announced on our social media channels, so please make sure to check us out there. Thank you once again, everyone, for attending today. Russell, thank you very much for the presentation, and we wish you all a great rest of the day.